All right, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. I'm very pleased to call to order the city council meeting for the afternoon of April 9th. Welcome, Tony, would you please call the roll? Jimenez? Present. Torres? Present. Cohen? Here. Ortiz? Davis? Here. Juan? Present. Candelas? Here. Foley? Here. Batra? Present. Kame? Here. Mahan? Here. You have a quorum. Great. Thank you. Now, if you're able, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Today's invocation will be given by the Kathleen McDonald High School cheer team, and Councilmember Cohen will tell us more. Yes, good afternoon. Welcome to April. April represents spring and is a month to celebrate the Earth, and of course we had a great start yesterday observing the amazing solar eclipse. Today's invocation represents a spring of sorts because Kathleen McDonald High School is the newest public school in Santa Clara County. It opened just over a year ago and serves the students of North San Jose and Alviso. Part of Santa Clara Unified School District, the campus is an amazing place with modern facilities and transformative technology. As a new school, they currently only serve freshmen and sophomores and will continue to add a grade level each year for the next two years. As part of the founding cheer team under Coach Grace Vena Gonzalez and Assistant Coach Jackie Duffer's guidance, the McDonald High School Condors Cheer Junior Varsity presented at Universal Cheerleaders Association with just three cheerleaders in their first season and took home three trophies and seven ribbons alongside many other established Bay Area schools. Coming a long way in just their second year, McDonald High School now is a whole squad of dedicated cheer athletes. They've worked hard, persevered, and are here today proud to represent McDonald High School. Welcome. Well, thank you for starting off our meeting today and congrats on all of your success. We're gonna move on to some ceremonial items. Councilmember Cohen, would you join me at the podium and we'll recognize Peninsula Humane Society and the SPCA South Bay Wildlife Center. Whoa, 
this is the, <laughs> I'm not like that tall. Okay, <clears throat> uh, for, <clears throat> I'm gonna clear my throat, sorry, I'm getting over a cold. For, the, for 30 years, the Wildlife Center of Silicon Valley, now known as the Peninsula Humane Society and SBCA South Bay Wildlife Center, has provided sick, injured, and orphaned wildlife in Santa Clara County with exceptional care, rehabilitation, and the opportunity for release. They also educate the public about coexisting peacefully with local wildlife through outreach events. We've all known for decades that when an animal is injured, we can bring them to the Wildlife Center, located in the back of Penitentia Creek Park, and they will get the care they need. Several years ago, a mother opossum fell into our pool, and one of the babies was left behind. I put the baby possum in a box and delivered it to the Wildlife Center, where it was nursed back to health. I've also taken a small bird for assistance, and I know many people who live along the East Foothills have had similar experiences. Last year, the Wildlife Center received almost 6,000 animals. Our office took a tour last year, and we were amazed at the level of care they provide with such a small staff in such a small space. But soon, they will have much more resource to care for our wildlife. They regularly care for songbirds, hummingbirds, doves, birds of prey, and owls. They have mammals ranging from squirrels to foxes to bobcats to the occasional deer. They recently merged with the Peninsula Humane Society with a brand new state-of-the-art wildlife center funded in perpetuity by Larry Ellison. The merger means they will no longer need to do fundraising to sustain their operations and will allow them to expand their services to uh, serve wildlife in San Francisco and San Mateo counties in addition to Santa Clara County. While the merger is bittersweet because it means the animal care operations will relocate from Penitentia Creek Park in San Jose to Saratoga, the opportunities presented are amazing and they will continue to operate the San Jose location as a drop-off center to bring injured and sick wildlife where they will stabilize the animals before transporting them to their Saratoga center for care. We are grateful for all their years of service and for everything they do for the amazing wildlife in our valley. In our valley. Let's thank the Peninsula Humane Society and SBCA South Bay Wildlife Center for their longtime service to our community. So now the mayor is going to pre present a uh, commendation to the uh, representatives. And is one of you is going to say a few words? Okay, go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm Ashley Kinney. I'm the um, Wildlife Rehabilitation Program Manager. And this is Holly. Um, and we are very grateful to be here. And um, we are looking forward to continuing to take in over 10,000 wild patients in our community. And we hope that um, we see some familiar faces um, uh, come see our new wildlife center in Saratoga. So thank you very much. Uh, I just want to say thank you, obviously, for being recognized for the work that we do. Um, I've grown up in San Jose. I've lived here since I was 10 years old, and I didn't really know even about the Wildlife Center until about 20 years ago. And um, we do amazing work with uh, very little, and now we have the opportunity to even serve more animals at the new facility. So thank you. All right, Councilmember Foley, if you join me at the podium, we will recognize and proclaim April as Distracted Drivers Awareness Month. Thank you, Mayor. Jackie, please come and join me. Whoa, that seems loud today. Today I'm here to proclaim April as Distracted Driving Awareness Month. As the chair of the Vision Zero Task Force, making our streets safer is a top priority for me. Everyone deserves to feel safe on our streets, whether they walk, bike, roll, or drive. 3,000 Americans are killed in distracted driving crashes each year, and drivers who use handheld devices are four times as likely to get into severe crashes. If you absolutely must send a text, pull over to the side of the road and do it safely while you're not moving. Even using your hands free, your phone hands free to make a phone call while driving is a source of distraction. There are three main types of distraction, visual, manual, and cognitive. 
Cell phones and other devices cause all three types of distraction. While hands-free devices may eliminate manual and visual distraction, they do not dis distract or they do not reduce cognitive distraction. In fact, a 2012 paper from the National Safety Council found that hands-free phones offer no safety benefit while driving, and drivers talking on cell phones make more mistakes than drivers talking to passengers. But talking on your phone is not the only distraction. Many are also guilty of eating or even putting on makeup while driving, both of which can be very dangerous. Remember that speeding is still the number one cause of fatal and severe collisions in San Jose. So even if you aren't driving distracted, you're not driving safely unless you're driving the speed limit. Coupled with dangerous behavior like speeding, the dangers of distracted driving become more amplified for those within and outside the vehicle. Today, I'd like to welcome Jackie Lowther from Santa Clara County for joining me in accepting this proclamation. Jackie Lowther is the Emergency Medical Services Director for Santa Clara County. In her role, she sees to it that the EMS responders on the scene of the crashes in the city are providing safe, quality, and effective pre-hospital care. In addition to her work at the county, she sits on the city's Vision Zero Task Force, which she has been involved with since 2018, even before the Vision Zero Action Plan was implemented in 2020. Her time on San Jose's Vision Zero Task Force has been instrumental in helping us create a clear direction for a path toward, forward for Vision Zero. I'd like to conclude by saying that many think that speeding and distracted driving are a problem for other people, but that's not true. We all share the responsibility to keep our roadways safe by paying attention when on the road and slowing down. I may also add that the city of San Jose must do more to improve safety on our streets through infrastructure so that when drivers inevitably drive unsafely, it doesn't have to result in a death. So today I proclaim Distracted Driving Awareness Month and invite Jackie Lowther to say a few words before Mayor Mahan presents today's proclamation. Jackie? Thank you, good afternoon. It is such an honor to be here. Mayor Mahan, Honorable Council, uh, the great thing about being here is it gives us the opportunity to actually share and talk about distracted driving, which actually causes about 8% of all fatal accidents. And as Council Person Foley mentioned, it's not just distracted driving, but speeding as well. It's an opportunity for us to announce our Just Drive campaign so please take the pledge and go to our website which I have to look at my notes just to make sure I don't get it wrong www.justdrivescc.org and please just take the pledge and it's not only for ourselves but all the other drivers that are next to you on the road it is something that we can control. Put those phones down. Whatever it is that you're doing, whatever activities can wait till you arrive at your destination. Things like distracted driving and speeding are actually in the driver's control. So thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. It's been an honor to be on the Vision Zero Task Force for these years, and thank you, and have a great, and enjoy the beautiful weather. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, Councilmember Ortiz, please join me at the podium and we will recognize and proclaim April 13th to April 16th 
as Cambodian New Year. Yes, thank you, Mayor. And I'd please ask uh, representatives of the Cambodian community to join me uh, here. Um, and I know that uh, it was asked by our monks to start uh, the, the proclamation with a blessing. So if you could please begin. ยันตาอมปุถยมุเลสะจานังนันตะวะทะโนเอวังทวังวิจิโยสะจยมังกะเลหะปะระจิตะปะลังเกสัยเสกะตะวิปะกะเรหะปิเสกะสะปะปุถ
schools, factories were closed, currency, private property were abolished. Anyone believed to be an intellectual, speaking a foreign language, being a professor, the arts, music, were all immediately killed. Skilled workers, anybody caught with modern technology, such as a wristwatch and glasses, were killed. And forced marches punctuated with atrocities committed by the Khmer Rouge. The millions that didn't flee Cambodia were hurt into a rural collective farm. Sorry. The new year for us, April 13th through 16th, we celebrate our Khmer culture and heritage. We pay tribute to those who perish and those fighting. We honor and recognize our elders, our parents, and our ancestors for their sacrifices and resilience. The new year means a new generation of individuals continuing to fight for freedom and democracy, a new year inspired for changes, and another year for new opportunities. Once again, thank you, Mayor Mahan and council members. We would like to invite you all to attend one of the three temples in San Jose to witness our festivities starting Friday and ending on Tuesday. Thank you very much. Thank you. And if Nancy would like to join us to receive the proclamation, and then we'll take a picture. And then if any of my colleagues would try to, would like to squeeze in here, please feel free to. All right, thank you all very much. We're on to orders of the day. Does anyone on the council have any changes to the printed agenda? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to adjournment. Today's meeting will be adjourned in memory of Lieutenant Rich Saito, who passed away on Friday, March 15th, 2024. Rich was a courageous police officer for the city of San Jose who led with boldness and a passion to provide safety and security for all residents and was a friend and ally to all of us here working to make our city a better place. We already very much miss him. I'll hand it off to Councilmember Torres to tell us more. Great, thank you, Mayor. It is my honor to give an adjournment to a man who needs no introductions, but I will do my best to speak about the legacy he left in our community and of course not to cry. Uh, Rich Saito passed away on March 14th and was a highly respected member of the San Jose community, serving as a retired lieutenant, a volunteer for the Japantown Community Congress of San Jose, 
founder of Japantown Prepared and a docent for the Japanese American Museum here in San Jose, in our lovely Japantown. He has left an unforgettable mark in our community. Lieutenant Rich Saito was a true champion for our community. I could consider him the unofficial mayor of Japantown. Sorry, mayor. He left everyone with a warmth that radiated from his presence and positivity, positivity that uplifted all who crossed his path. He touched the lives of countless individuals, including my own. As a teenager in the Washington neighborhood, I remember feeling the sense of unease towards, towards law enforcement, viewing them more as a threat. But Rich changed that perspective. He bridged the gap between law enforcement and our community, making us feel safe and valued. He introduced me and my friends from the Washington neighborhood to Camp Defy, a program that empowered us to resist the temptations of drugs, gangs, and alcohol while nurturing our self-esteem. Lieutenant Rich Seidel's absence will be deeply felt, but his legacy will continue to inspire us. We extend our deepest condolences to the Seidel family and the entire Japantown community who is here today. Though he may no longer walk among us, his spirit lives on the hearts of those he touched. Thank you, Lieutenant Rich Seidel, for sharing your light with us. You'll be truly missed. I now invite David Seidel, Rich Son, to say a few words. On behalf of my family, I'd like to thank all of you, especially Councilman Torres, for recognizing my father. Um, looking back on my dad, I mean, his defining characteristics were um, service and kindness. And the way that that manifested was through his decades as a police officer, uh, as a volunteer, a teacher, a community leader. And he really worked hard to instill those traits into my two brothers and I. Um, he would have been overwhelmed to you know, hear these sentiments given about him. Um, and I think that he really embodied what it means to be a, a civil servant. You know, he took that extremely, like literally, uh, without um, any subterfuge, that, that was what he was. And uh, he just loved San Jose so much. And he really gave his whole life to making it the kind of place that he could be proud of, but that my brothers and I could be proud of and, and live in also. So, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Councilmember Torres. Rich absolutely represented the very best of us. We'll miss him greatly. We're very sorry for your loss. We are on to the closed session report. Nora, do we have anything out of closed session? Thanks, Mayor. We do not have anything to report out of closed session today. Okay, next is the consent calendar. Don't believe anyone requested polling. Are there any items the council would like to poll, or do we have a motion? Move approval. Second. Thank you. Do we have public comment on the consent calendar? There are no cards. Okay. Coming back to the council, let's vote. Motion passes unanimously. Great, thank you. Okay, we are on to item 3.1, report of the city manager. Thank you, Mayor. I have no report today. Okay, great, thank you. We're on to item 3.3. This is the proposed ordinances authorizing the removal of vehicles parked in violation of prohibited large vehicle parking zones and no overnight parking zones. Do we have a brief staff presentation? No, okay, we just have staff here ready to answer questions. Okay, why don't we go to the public first? I have um, several, I have a few cards. Ashley, I can't read the last name, but it, I have Ashley, Gabriella, Gail, and then I have two cards that just say the number three and the topic of homeless. So I'm not sure if it's for 3.3 or 3.4. So I'd also like to, to call down Chris and then the anonymous card. So again, that's Gabriella, Ashley, Gail, Chris, and anonymous. And whoever comes to the microphone first, just go straight to the microphone. Hi, 
Hi, good afternoon. Um, I really don't know why I'm here because I'm sure you've all made up your mind on what you're going to be doing. I had a group of my um, RV folks that wanted to come, but again, why? I have brought many RV folks into this chambers and have any of you ever reached out to them or talked to them? What is going on? Why are they being pushed all over? You are criminalizing the unhoused people because they don't have a home. Maybe they shouldn't be near schools, okay? But you know, there's no place for them to go. Let's get Berryessa open. I am so tired of hearing day after day after day, it's not happening now, it's not happening now. I just had a group of unhoused people that were abated by the police. That's what the police do now. They abate the unhoused people, so they go into different neighborhoods. Please, I just don't know what else to do. I've been doing this for years, it's very frustrating. You know, they didn't want to come today. I had a whole group of them, but again, why? Nobody listens to them. You're not listening to people that are boots on the ground or people that live on the ground. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. My name is Gabriela Gabrian. I'm chair of the Experience Advisory Board. I have been on house previously for two decades. Sometimes I lived in uh, RV. And the last time I lived in an RV, I had already been stripped of my belongings, uh, my freedom, and my hut. I was only in that RV for six months. But the trauma that I experienced that six months is with me here today, 20 years later. Uh, I speak with a lot of people in RVs. Most of them are ill and they need medical care, not um, restrictions on where they're gonna park. Some of them are elderly with no access to help. If we wanna be loving and kind, we would offer them resources rather than make life more difficult. I remember going to jail and having to pay fines, but didn't have an income. So later, when I fought it, I spent time in jail after surgery on a hard bed. You think violating and taking people's belongings, they lost everything, is gonna help that person along? It's just dehumanizing, just because it doesn't look good in the neighborhood. If you see a dog on the side of the road, do you not pull over and take that dog for help? Why are we treating our people less than dogs? However, when you look at the person, that is stripped of their sanity. That's representation of who you are today. Thank you, next speaker. Hello, my name is Ann Harris and I raised five daughters and three sons. I have a daughter that's bipolar. She was in the system for 30 years, in and out of jail and prison. So right now she's struggling trying to be on her own. So she has a little fifth wheel trailer. She doesn't really have a license or anything that go with it. And she has a little raggedy car. So she's parked on the side of the street and uh, one of the, the supervisor's ladies came out and started taking pictures and told her that, you know, she was gonna have to move. So she said, well, this is all I have. Why do I have to, can I just have something? I spent an hour talking to this lady on yesterday evening. We had a nice conversation. And um, I've been in the Valley for 60 years. I retired from VTA, I worked 55 years. I'm coming up on 87 years old, so I've been around a long time. I've witnessed the situation with the homeless, so I said, okay. Before the pandemic hit, 
Greed had taken over and people were being forced out of their homes. Some of them had been in their places many years, kept the places up, paid their rent on time, but they were still forced out of their homes. So we had those people who were homeless. There was a park over in Sunnyvale. There was about three miles of homeless vehicles, people in RVs parked along the side of the street. There was a time that they wouldn't have been allowed to be there, but they didn't have any prayer else to go. So the lady, she said, well, what do you think we could do? I'm sorry, your time is up. Next speaker. Hi, uh, thank you for letting me speak. Uh, my name is Ashley Rosen. I am a policy and advocacy chairperson for the Lived Experience Advisory Board at Silicon Valley, but I'm here today speaking for myself. What some view as a nuisance or burden, others view as a home and the only thing keeping them sheltered. This issue needs to be grouped into housing and issues surrounding the unhoused. This is not a parking issue, although I can see it as an easy cop out to use parking sites to avoid having to actually do a sweep and find a solution for these folks. A lot of these people became unhoused due to COVID and rising rents, spending their savings on homes on wheels to support their families. The city should be required to find an alternative location or solution um, for them as the RV parking sites one are not big enough and they have too many barriers and they're turning down people that are applying to go park there. Um, passing this would uh, destroy lives and create more homelessness. While I can see from the point of view as business owners and homeowners, this isn't the correct order of actions. Please come up with a solution and alternative prior to passing this. Solutions before sweeps. Please stop criminalizing the unhoused and furthering this. It goes against what the city is working towards. Tell them where they can go, not where they can't. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Uh, my name is Chris Bang. Uh, I live in the Vista Park area. And um, I appreciate the effort that's being made to uh, provide housing and uh, security and uh, comfort to the homeless. Um, however, um, my question at this point is, what incentives or programs are being offered to help the homeless to escape their homeless situation? Do I have any answers to this question? And where do I find the answers? Sir, I'm sorry, we don't respond in public comment, but we can certainly follow up offline to get you more answers. All right, thank you. Thank you. Back to the council. Okay, thank you, Tony. Um, I, I appreciate the public comment. Thank you to everyone who came to uh, share a perspective and ask questions. I uh, also want to thank the students at KIPP. We had a couple dozen students who reached out to Councilmember Ortiz and I and our teams talking about the challenges they were facing just trying to, frankly, get on and off their, their campus each day and get an education. Um, I, I do, so I appreciate the collaboration with Councilmember Ortiz and our, our colleagues on the memo that initiated this body of work, that's Councilmember Cohen, Councilmember Jimenez, and Councilmember Dewan. Um, and we've discussed this at great length, so I, I won't spend too much time, but I, I do just want to note for those who are listening and those who took the time to come speak that the goal is to be very measured. In fact, we're starting, our intention, as we've noted in past meetings, is to start with a very limited pilot around three of our most impacted schools and to try to strike that balance where I, I don't think there'd be any disagreement here that our primary strategy for addressing lived-in vehicles and unmanaged encampments is to create safe, managed places where people can go. We've made great strides in the last couple of years in standing up interim units, 
We have a large safe parking site underway, many more in the pipeline. In the meantime, we have to do a better job of managing the conditions on our roads and safety, particularly for our children. We face a similar mandate related to protecting our waterways, now driven by uh, our stormwater permit and, and our obligations under the Clean Water Act. So um, I just want to assure folks the intention is not to criminalize homelessness, but it is to delineate areas where folks cannot be and in other areas provide services and do our best to focus our limited resources on expanding the safe managed places where people can go. To the question of incentives and the supportive services, I can at least say for our interim sites, and this is true as well for our permanent supportive sites, people do get connected with case management, with access to healthcare, job training in many cases. The goal is to help people get to greater levels of self-sufficiency. And we do, we do measure the performance of those programs. That's a longer side point that we can follow up on offline for those who are interested. But um, I support this ordinance and appreciate the students uh, helping us understand the impacts they were facing and working with us to craft what I think is a very balanced and measured approach. This item, of course, has to do with oversized vehicles, whether or not they're lived in, that pose a public safety risk. And then um, the next item is specific to tent encampments. So with that, I'll turn to colleagues for comments, questions, and uh, a motion. Vice Mayor. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the speakers and, and your, um, your input. Um, one of the things, I know that um, we are going to pilot three specific areas, but I think that in terms of looking at, um, you know, sort of a, a tier of priorities, uh, perhaps we should also look at what are the areas that are causing uh, roadway safety issues. If you have a big truck or something as an impediment that you can't even see around, and because we don't have uh, the engineering analysis or the outreach or anything to be able to deal with it, um, I think that that's, that's a problem. And I think that we, while can't go to everything, we should think about what are the next, what's the next phase after this pilot? Because roadway safety is a big issue. If we're not gonna enforce uh, the, the parking or the compliance or anything like that, uh, then, uh, you know, it's sort of the little bit of the Wild West where people are going to park wherever they want to park because nobody's going to do anything about it, uh, especially oversized vehicles where you can't see around them. And I think um, perhaps we can prioritize uh, roadway safety as well. So as we're moving along uh, saying, hey, you know, we don't have the resources to do everything, what are the things that come to the top? as uh, something that would, um, would be um, feasible. The other thing I would say, and I think I've mentioned it in a prior council meeting, is that we need to start going back to some of those locations where perhaps at the time uh, there wasn't an appetite for uh, you know, uh, uh, these parking lots or private property or uh, you know, areas of um, uh, you know, that might be available for safe parking, uh, because I think that we do need to find something, somewhere, for, for uh, um, these RVs to go to. And perhaps we need to do that revisiting uh, as we're piloting these three spots, because I see the, the issue is not going away, and we need to perhaps circle back and maybe at the time, you know, there was, oh no, we don't want to do this. Perhaps now things are different. So I, I don't want to give up on that. I think that we really, really need to push to be able to, um, to uh, get this done. And with that, I would actually move the item. There's a second from Councilman Condolas. Uh, Councilman Batra. <coughs> I'll be supporting this. Um motion here uh, become our city having the ordinance which establishes some of the parking violations will become toyable I hope that that message 
will cause voluntary cooperation and we would not have to tow any of these vehicles. As those are causing these safety concerns, and these are not going to be random sites where we're going to be asking that the, if the vehicles are left there with the signs saying that you cannot park there for overnight or there are uh, large vehicles. These are going to be studied locations with the engineering analysis having done that they are a true cause to the safety of the neighborhood. And if those are the things we would expect, whether they are unhoused or housed people, whoever are using those vehicles, will be voluntarily cooperate because we all need to be able to live together in a harmony without causing disruption to the other people. So it is not criminalizing anybody. It is really to seek voluntary cooperation to make sure that we are all living safely together. Okay. So, and I like the fact that these sites are not going to be random. These sites are going to be with supported by engineering analysis to make sure that they deserve to have the signs which we are going to be putting it on. So as a result, I think it is a very good action which we are taking and it is going to make everybody safer and more comfortable in living. We do need to do more to be able to find the people who are unhoused, whether they live in vehicles or whether they live in, um, in the tents, we need to find them places where they can comfortably live and rebuild their life because they have often gotten off the track and we need to bring them on track. There are many programs which we are not going to be going into here. They are available on our website and we are going to continue doing more of those and each one of those programs we are going to make it larger till we take care of all the 5,000 or so homeless people in our vicinity. But I think this ordinance establishment is a step in the right direction and it will improve life for everybody so I totally support it. And I do appreciate the comments which were made by the people here who have come to alert us that yes, there are 5,000 people in this city who are unhoused and we all need to do things more for them and we have the responsibility to do it. And in this council, you have a total support for that activity. Thank you, Mayor. Thanks, Council Member. Council Member Cohen? Yeah, thank you. Um, just for some context, we, we had an extensive discussion as a council on, about this item. I, I can't remember, if two months ago or so, and this is a return to council with the details of an ordinance that we requested at that time. So I just wanna make sure it's understood that this isn't a new item, this is something that we previously discussed. Um, just wanna, one quick clarification question. Um, as I read in the notes, this is not something that will be immediately enforced or something that we're planning to utilize right away, but something that we're putting in place so that we can evaluate streets in the future and have a tool in our arsenal for, um, for making sure people are in the right places and, where, and in not places where they shouldn't be. Is that correct? That's correct. Matthew Tolmay, I'm one of the deputy city attorneys. This is the first step. It'll just give us the opportunity to designate locations by resolution. Right. So. I, I just think it's important that we, in parallel with the work that we're doing to build locations for people to go, that we're also building the ordinances that will give us the tools to then be able to enforce uh, rules once we can offer people places to go. So these things are happening in parallel. And I think it's important uh, to make put these tools in place as we're also working on the other. And you, you've heard from me many times about my frustration, the length of time it's taking to put in place the solutions. Uh, I've been very vocal about the need to expedite the site at Berryessa to be able to get RVs off the streets and give them and offer them places, and I will continue to push for that to be done as quickly as possible. I will say one of the worst parts of the job that I have is having to continually encourage people to exercise patience, it's both for the people who are in RVs or in encampments looking for a place to go, and for the district residents and businesses whose lives are disrupted by concentrations of RVs and other 
um, encampments in their direct vicinity. So um, I'm hopeful that as we bring more safe parking and EIH sites online, we'll be able to get a handle on the problem, but this tool will also allow us to have better control of what's appropriate, where are appropriate places in the city uh, for people to park their RVs and where, where it's not appropriate. So I will support the motion. Thank you. Mayor, if I could just sure. add to Matthew's comments, John Russo, Director of Transportation. I, I wanted to make sure that uh, Council and Mayor knew that there will be some in, uh, implementation of this, the pilot locations for the three schools will we'll be able to move forward even this year to a relatively short time frame. Beyond that, however, that's going to require some additional resources that will come through the budget process. So I just want to make sure that we will be doing something. And to uh, Vice Mayor's comments, that work that we're going to do for the pilot locations will really help us to scale, understand what it is that we're going to need to do, how to do it, how much it might cost, and that sort of thing. So we are looking for that pilot project to help us build and describe how we're going to do the rest of a program should it get funded. Thanks, John. Appreciate that. And uh, Councilman Cohen, appreciate your points, all, all really important ones. And I'm grateful to you and your team for pushing so hard to accelerate the Barry SSA parking site as well. I don't see any other hands. Tony, let's vote. Motion passes unanimously. Great, thank you. Now, relatedly, we're on to item 3.4, which is the proposed ordinance codifying the existing encampment management program around schools and establishing that clearance or buffer zone. And that's distinct from vehicles, which is why we're taking it up separately. Do we have any public comment on item 3.4? Gail? No speak, no cards. Okay, coming back to the council, let me go to Councilmember Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. And first and foremost, I just want to express my gratitude to the administration um, and, of course, the collaborative effort um, spearheaded by multiple uh, departments and, and staff um, just to make sure that we can find a solution for establishing safe passageways to schools for our our students, especially those in our most vulnerable populations. And I also want to thank the mayor and, and our, our other colleagues for collaborating um, on this uh, memo, which I know um, hopefully we will have unanimous uh, vote in support of uh, today. Now, g given the uh, challenging circumstances that our youth already endure, um, I'm glad that our city, um, we're doing our part to guarantee that these students can thrive in their academic pursuits. And I know key to this is a safe learning um, environment, further supported by the incredible uh, array of school administrators, teachers, and support staff that already make um, education possible here in this valley. Um, although this push began with youth leadership and administration at KIPP, San Jose Collegiate, from some amazing students, very courageous. Um, I realize that these issues affecting just the site in my district are not unique, right? This is occurring throughout the, throughout the city and in multiple districts of, of San Jose. Um, and, you know, just, just like KIPP's student bodies are facing it, other student bodies are also facing it, um, and their administration are um, experiencing other uh, similar challenges. Um, and with that, you know, I do have some line of questions similar to um, what the vice mayor was um, asking in regards to timelines and potentially adding other schools um, to our initial pilot. And I am aware, you know, pilot, we're trying to prove the concept here and then hopefully expand it down the line. But regarding the schools that are part of the approved three pilot areas, how long will this pilot program last before we can evaluate um, adding additional sites. You know, Council Member, I just want to clarify, the pilot is related to the RVs. Mm -hmm. This ordinance, which is about tents and structures and belongings, oh, I see. this is something we already do. It's not a pilot and we do it at every school already. So it's not, oh, this will continue. We're just codifying it That's today. That's correct, oh, we're see, just codifying and we're codifying our practice into law. We mm -hmm. expanded it slightly to include um, licensed public or private preschools. I don't think that's gonna be a huge impact only mm -hmm. because as many of you know, universal pre-K is almost here fully, which means they'll be at the schools that were already there 
patrolling anyways. Oh, that I see. Sense. I see. Yeah. Okay. I don't think it adds a ton of new sites by having that little bit of expansion. Okay, so this is separate from the three pilots that we were going to do for the, the other item. That's the RV stuff. Ah, okay. Yeah. It looks like I mixed up which item to ask my questions on. <laughs> um, that, that's fine. Um, well, then thank you. That, that's all. Thanks, Councilor. Would you like to move the item? Let's please move the item. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I don't see any other hands. Let's vote. Motion passes unanimously. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. On item 3.5, language accessibility audit report. Good afternoon, City Council, Joe Royce, City Auditor. I'm here with Brittany Harvey, Adrian Perez, and Halad Hyder from my office for our language accessibility. The city can strengthen efforts to address language equity across its services audit report. Also in the box are Carolina Camarena and Marisa Diaz from the City Manager's Office of Communications. The city of San Jose serves a diverse population with more than 57% of its residents reporting speaking a language other than English at home. Under the city's language equity policy and guidelines, departments are expected to take reasonable steps to provide equitable access to language assistance services. This includes such things as informing limited or non-English speakers of eligibility for programs and services, ensuring staff has proper training in the use of over-the-phone interpretation services, making phone tree instructions available in Spanish, Vietnamese, and Chinese, prioritizing vital documents for translation in those languages, and incorporating various best practices to assist limited or non-English speaking residents. The administration has developed resources to assist departments, including providing language and cultural responsiveness trainings for city staff, developing agreements with language translation and interpretation vendors, and providing premium pay for certified bilingual staff who assist non-English residents in accessing city services. I do want to point out the city has make, been making efforts to improve how it interacts with residents, customers, and businesses. Two related bodies of work include the development of a customer service vision and standards and the work of the Office of Racial Equity. The objective of this audit was to assess city communications for compliance with the city's language equity policy and guidelines. For the audit, we focused on common customer contacts for direct services provided by city departments. We did not include interpretation services for city council or other public meetings or other broad community engagement activities. We had two findings. The first finding, is that departments have made some progress on addressing language accessibility, but additional work remains. Based on a review of five city services, we found that all had made some progress in implementing aspects of the city's language equity policy and guidelines. Some highlights include the library and energy departments consistently translating vital documents into multiple languages. This, the library's checkout machines also provide service in multiple languages. There's multilingual signage at the library and the animal care center. The fire department has procedures to identify fire stations with high multilingual needs and encourages bilingual firefighters to bid for assignment at those locations. And multiple departments had access to or tracked customer calls or services provided in different languages. However, we did note that the reviewed services varied in the extent to which they addressed the policy's requirements and best practices. And we found addressing language at common points of contact with customers such as phone trees, the city's website, and at city facilities can be improved. We also found that departments have not generally assigned language access coordinators, which is a best practice recommended in the policy. It should be noted that some individuals and departments fulfill aspects of that role. The administration can also provide additional guidance or resources for departments, such as templates for formal language access plans and assistance in identifying vital documents for translation and others. Lastly, there are, no curr there are currently no performance metrics or systems to gauge progress on language accessibility and promote improvement over time. We recommend the administration should monitor language accessibility of common points of customer contacts across departments, require customer-facing departments designate language access coordinators and develop language access plans, 
develop additional resources to support department efforts around language accessibility, and create performance metrics and a system to review progress. The second finding is that bilingual staff are a resource to the city, though clarity on their role is needed. As of June 2023, the city had close to 900 certified bilingual staff who provide language assistance to residents. Bilingual staff play a critical role in helping residents access city services and resources in language that they understand. They use their bilingual skills to provide direct services to residents, businesses and visitors, and to translate written or electronic material. Certified bilingual staff generally have, have a positive view of their work and assist their own departments as well as other city departments. Certified bilingual staff noted, however, that their regular duties can be impacted by, by their bilingual workload. More than half of bilingual staff responding to an auditor survey noted that their bilingual responsibilities impacted their workload, and 27% said it had a high impact on their regular workload. Additionally, some staff have been asked to act as interpreters, which they may or may not be qualified or trained to do. And although the city has made improvements in the bilingual certification process, there may potentially be certification records not on file for some staff. So we recommend the administration to clarify the expectations and role of bilingual staff, including those that do not receive bilingual pay, and reconcile bilingual certif certification records for staff who receive bilingual pay as necessary. The report has 12 recommendations. We'd like to thank the city manager's office of communications, the city attorney's office, certified bilingual staff who participated in our survey as well as focus groups that we conducted during the audit, and all city departments who assisted in the audit for their time, information, insight, and cooperation. Administration has reviewed the re information report and the response is shown in the yellow pages, and our report is available on our website as you see on the slide. I ask that you accept the report and I'll turn it over to the administration for their response and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Carolina Camarena, Director of Communications. The administration would like to thank Joe and his team in the city auditor's office for their comprehensive analysis of the compliance with the city's language equity policy and guidelines. The administration agrees with the two findings and 12 recommendations identified in the report. We are eager to begin coordinating the implementation of the recommendations with departments and align the recommendations with other city initiatives such as the customer service vision standards and efforts led by the Office of Racial Equity. I would like to note this is the first year the city's had a language access manager, Marisa Diaz, and the recommendations included in this audit laid the foundation for our work plan over the next several years. The Office of Communications looks forward to improving ways to provide excellent services to all through language access. With that, we are ready for any questions. Great, thank you, Joe and Carolina, appreciate it. Let's go to public comment first. I have no cards. Okay. Going back to the council, colleagues. Council member Foley. Of the report. Any other questions or comments? Okay, let's vote. I think I clicked end too soon. I thought that was the... Cohen, how do you vote? Okay, motion passes unanimously with Kamei absent. Okay, thank you. Thanks again, Joe, city audit team. All right, we're on to item 3.6, and I will turn to our city manager, Jennifer McGuire, to make some opening remarks. Yes, thank you, Mayor and City Council. As we are all aware, the city of San Jose is the, is the 12th largest city in our nation with a little over 7,000 full-time equivalent employees. I have said this before and will continue to say it as often as I need to. It is absolutely paramount that we safeguard our community from any person who does not hold themselves to the highest professional standards and has not adhered to our policies or those of basic societal norms or as law-abiding people. The vast majority of our employees who choose public service do so to better our community, particularly our most vulnerable. At times, though, some fall short of the city's expectations, and when warranted, disciplinary actions are taken. Unfortunately, a few just do not belong in public service. 
As I have demonstrated previously, I will strengthen our tools and policies for the greater good of our community every time it is needed. In the last two years, I've increased the tools and policies that allow us to take immediate action in cases where employees are the subject of credible criminal complaints and the conduct has the potential to impact the safety or financial health of the community or other employees. It is incredibly important that we maintain the public's confidence in how we handle these situations. My additional recommendations on changes that I think are prudent to our organization are to our open government and ethics resolution and related policies, which will allow us to provide clarity on the potential disclosure of employee records relating to serious employee misconduct and the obligations of our workforce to report potential misconduct concerns. Allison Suggs, Assistant Director of the City Manager's Office of Employee Relations, will provide you with a brief presentation on these changes we're recommending today. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Jennifer. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Um, my name is Allison Suggs. I'm the Assistant Director in the City Manager's Office of Employee Relations. In April 2006, the City Council approved the establishment of a Sunshine Reform Task Force, resulting in recommendations regarding open government. One recommendation was to publicly disclose disciplinary action taken to address misconduct and performance issues. Different disclosure requirements were recommended for city officials and employees in the classified civil service. Unlike, excuse me, unlike city officials, disciplinary information for employees in the classified civil service was viewed as confidential and not subject to disclosure unless permitted by the Public Records Act. For disciplinary actions taken regarding employees in the classified civil service, the reforms called for a log containing information uh, that is anonymized and was to be made available for inspection. Since 2008, the city has published a public discipline report that is available on the city's website. As Jennifer indicated, the city's workforce is comprised of thousands of dedicated, hardworking, and well-meaning employees that endeavor to provide the best possible services to the community that we're all fortunate enough to serve. But unfortunately, we do have employees falter and they fall short of those expectations, and sometimes that misconduct is egregious. When warranted, disciplinary action is taken to address the inappropriate conduct and or substandard performance and to define a standard of conduct for employees. While the city generally regards an employee's personnel information to be confidential to the employee, we recognize a need to balance the public's right to know when and how disciplinary action is taken by providing information in specific circumstances. With the City Council's approval, the, res the revisions to the Consolidated Open Government and Ethics Resolution would document the circumstances under which serious misconduct engaged in by city employees would be subject to disclosure. Upon the City Council's approval, the City Manager would make corresponding changes to the City's Investigation Principles Policy and the Discipline Policy. In addition to the recommended changes to the Consolidated Open Government and Ethics Resolution, the Administration is further proposing to modify both the Code of Ethics for officials and employees of the City of San Jose policy that is contained in the Council Policy Manual, as well as the Code of Ethics policy contained in the City Administrative Policy Manual. With the Council's approval, each will be updated to describe an employee's obligation to report misconduct that, if true, uh, has the potential to impact the safety or financial health of the community and will include a reminder to all city employees that the city's non-retaliation policy describes each employee's right to raise concerns in good faith without retaliation or reprisal. With that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Allison. Let's go to public comment first. There are no cards. Okay. Back to the council. Do we have any questions on item 3.6? Let's vote. Motion passes unanimously with Kame and Torres absent. Great, thank you. Okay, we're on to item 3.7, adoption of ordinances to establish the new Rule 20A underground utility districts. We have a staff presentation. Right. 
Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, my name is Catherine Brown. I'm the Assistant Director of Public Works, and with me today presenting is Jay Guevara, our Deputy Director. And we're here to present on the Rule 20A Utility Underground Program. Just a quick agenda run through of what we're going to discuss. You know, what is Rule 20A Undergrounding, the timeline, the opportunity that we have, next steps, and staff's recommendation. So what is Rule 20A undergrounding? Uh, to simplify, it is uh, moving the overhead distribution utility lines to underground facilities. Um, and this is a before and after picture of the last Rule 20A project that was completed um, off of White Road adjacent to the Robert Cruz Alum Rock Branch Library. Uh, this was completed in January 2021. So you can see the before and after photos uh, showing the distribution lines uh, in the before shot and after this nice, clean, beautiful building. Uh, just to reemphasize some of the purpose and benefits of the undergrounding program, it allows street trees to grow to full maturity, uh, enhances pedestrian safety, uh, reduces the storm outage potential from downed power lines, and then the new underground systems are also more reliable. Uh, and in addition to the resiliency and reliability, um, it also improves the neighborhood appearance and increases property values. So since uh, September of last year, when we previously brought this to council, just a few things have been happening. Uh, this timeline goes over some of the actions that the Public Works staff has been doing. Uh, you know, following our director's vision to uh, seize this opportunity uh, on maximizing the Rule 20A credits uh, allocated to the City of San Jose, city staff moved fairly quickly um, and early, uh, sorry, reaching out early with engineering and outreach uh, to the public and coordinating with utility companies, property owners, and council districts, as noted on this slide. I uh, just want to take a quick opportunity to thank our Public Works staff, I think there's a few of them in the audience, uh, David Simois, uh, Luan Huen, Khan Huen, and Norman Mascarenas uh, for their leadership and efforts behind this. And then additionally, thank PG&E for their uh, willingness to meet with us in the field and discuss all of these projects. And just quickly elaborating on one of the portions of that timeline is you know, some of the community meetings that staff provided. They conducted 10 community meetings uh, between February 12th through the 16th, and um, really just to provide the intentions of the program and explain the types of the projects, and then allow time and space for the community to ask questions. And in general, some of the feedback, uh, I think some community members see the benefit of fire safety and new infrastructure, and you know the also, some of the non-supportive feedback was just the potential out-of-pocket uh, costs being a little bit too much. Uh, so to talk through the opportunity that we have, I'm going to turn it over to Jay Guevara. Good afternoon, Deputy Director Jay Guevara. So let's discuss the more than $61 million opportunity. This bar graph illustrates the three categories. The blue section at the base is what the city's current Rule 28 credits that have been legislated and allocated by pg and &E and CPUC. The next bar graph in the brick red color represents our group number one of potential and proposed districts that can add an additional 21 million in allocations. Finally, in the green color, the opportunity increases further so that the city can compete and potentially gain more than 40 million for work credits allocated to other jurisdictions to be potentially reallocated to the city of San Jose. Combining the red and green boxes is what brings us to the full $61 million opportunity. So what are the next steps? If city council approves the proposed new undergrounding districts, this slide provides the timeline milestones on our journey before Rule 28 sunsets in 2033. Please note that PG&E is still developing the reallocation plan for unused work credits from other jurisdictions. At the PG&E staff level, the city has already 
has confirmation that all 14 proposed underground utility districts meet the Rule 20A criteria. Finally, the administration will need to coordinate with the mayor's office and the city council to ensure that the city's interests are shared broadly and widely with PG&E and the CPUC at the most opportune times to make sure this advances to the several steps that this gra uh, graphic provides. I'd like to close with the staff recommendation to approve all 14 proposed undergrounding districts. This utilizes and retains the remaining 21 million in Rule 28 work credits, as well as places the city at the forefront amongst jurisdictions to seek and compete for the reallocation of $40 million for the second group. Staff will also integrate reporting on our efforts and advocacy with transparency at our annual Rule 20A and 20B work plan presentation to City Council. With that, we're ready for any questions. Great, thank you both and everyone in Public Works who's uh, supported this work, clearly very important. Uh, do we have any public comment? Yes, I have two cards, Bill Jewell and Debbie. Good afternoon. Um, this is for the required conversion of the project that will remove existing utility poles and overhead lines and install them underground. Um, PG&E, AT&T, and Comcast will fund the removal of all poles and overhead lines, overhead wires, I'm sorry, and um, the above ground electrical services to buildings and facilities on your property must be converted. I'm kind of cutting and pasting here to be quick. The property owner will be responsible for the conversion once the construction takes place. The cost of converting services could range between $10,000 and could cost up to $15,000. Um, forgive me here. Uh, over on San Salvador, I have a little apartment with students that are paying very low rent so that they can go to school. Paying that $15,000 conversion fee will take away about three months of my income. Income that I pay property taxes with, water bills and utilities, business taxes, repairs. Um, on the story road map at my mom's house, there's just six houses, properties. The rest are public storages on both sides of story road and 101, Highway 101, and they're exempt. So why do the six houses have to pay? Why do, you know, they, they get off. Every other parcel noted in the map is a business. Those are homes. I think aesthetically, it will look very nice without poles and wires, plus safety-wise. I also think with the outrageous fees that, are, that they already charge us, PG&E, AT&T, and Comcast should pay for all the conversions that take place, not the small homeowner. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker. Afternoon. Thank you for your time today. My name is William Jewell, and I'm a resident of District 2, specifically Coyote Road which is one of the locations I outlined here on item 3.7 of the schedule. Recently, I received a notice a little over a week ago that our home was identified as one of the number in our neighborhood which would be responsible for burying electric lines as per Rule 20A. While I support the efforts to make our neighborhood safer by making the line safer, I find it unfair that a small number of homeowners are burdened with the cost of retrofitting infrastructure that benefits the entire neighborhood. So what I'm referring to is two-thirds of the way through this letter, it gives a figure of ten thousand of possibly ten thousand dollars or higher. When I get a letter like this, it's generally about twice as much as what's required. Um, I have called the numbers that are listed as contacts at the bottom of this letter no return, no response. So there's a lot of questions and I think that there needs to be a lot of answers before anything 
goes forward with this because I'm just a little homeowner, you know. Um, I work nights, actually. I'm supposed to be working tonight, go to work in like another four or five hours. Um, I'm not a rich man. So, you know, when you're talking ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, you know, that's a lot of money for me. So, you know, it's something to consider. Thank you very much. Back to the council. Thank you, Tony, and thank you both for speaking. Let me turn to colleagues first. Councilman Cohen. <clears throat> yeah, thank you, Mayor, and uh, thanks, staff, for bringing this forward. I want to thank you for the proactive efforts to complete as many undergrounding projects as possible. Um, as has been noted, these projects do make our community safer and more attractive, um, and I think they're long overdue, and I wish we could do even more of them. <coughs> um, it also should be noted that, that I think, if I understand this correctly, the, the seven projects on the first group are likely to proceed. We're likely to get that funding. The second group of projects are things that we're being uh, proactive and trying to take care of, you know, find resources that otherwise may not have been available um, because other, and, and look into what other cities are not using and try to bring in more money to hopefully increase the number of projects we can do. Is that a correct assessment? Thank you for the question, Council Member, Deputy Director Jay Guevara. Um, I'd like to clarify that the first group is no more likely to happen than the second group. It's about targeting those different colored uh, bar, bar graph colors. So the first group is targeting, for lack of a better term, classic, traditional Rule 20A. Uh, that's in the 21 million that the city is still owed over the many years that fee payers have been paying rates. The second group of seven is targeting to be competitive to seek the additional 40 million that would be potentially reallocated from other jurisdictions. So we were strategic in finding the most competitive for both categories, but neither one is necessarily more likely to advance because of the overall PG&E CPUC process that is Rule 20A and one reason why the CPUC is sunsetting the program. But as we secure funding in, in either bucket, the projects on the group, the first group would be, com would be completed first. Of course, I know that that does require the cooperation of PG and the others to make it happen, and we can't guarantee that they would ever come through. But, if the, but there will be, that that's a, gives us an order of when those, of which projects would come first, right? Between the two groups, if I were a betting man, the first group is more likely to happen, but I want to be very clear that there's no guarantees. Right, there's no guarantee even for the first group, but certainly the second group is even more pie in the sky, although I hope that we can you know, find some funding to start breaking, you know, chewing, chewing off parts of that list as well. I believe that is a fair characterization. Okay, thank you. Um, and I know that the, the big concern, obviously, I mean, residents and everybody would love, loves the undergrounding portion. The, the issue, of course, is that some people, and not all, have electrical panels that may not be compatible once the process is in, once the new um, system is in place. Of course, receiving a letter doesn't mean that you don't have an incompatible electrical panel. It just informs you that everybody's electrical panel will have to be tested at the time, and if it isn't compatible, an upgrade will need to be made. And the panel is the responsibility of the homeowner, and this is just about the electrical connection and not the other connections. Is that correct? That is correct. The intent of that template letter uh, is to encourage people to come to the community meetings that were conducted in February and to provide really a worst case scenario of the ceiling, the, the, the high end of the cost range, so that people are not cut. Off guard. But for many, an electrical panel upgrade is far less than the $10,000 that's on the list, but it could be above you know, some, some significant outlay that a resident could receive. Yes, we, we tried to be conservative by providing a high number, as well as the maps included in each of the 14 proposed districts has the letter C, noting where connections are likely to be required. Uh, for example, in one of the speaker districts for District 2, um, that district actually doesn't require any connections, but the template letter still has that general information. And you know, we're already talking in our, in our city about a process for helping people upgrade their electrical panels for the eventual electrification of their appliances. 
So people who currently are using gas appliances eventually will need to be replacing them with electric water heaters, electric uh, uh, heat pumps and other things so that they would, and they may need to upgrade their electrical panel to do that. I know this is sort of outside the scope of this discussion, but as we begin to have a conversation this year on how we're going to allocate our reserves and our clean energy fund, we are, I'm hopeful that we're going to begin allocating some of that money to help homeowners make those conversions. So there may be, there may be a possibility to supplement whatever the reimbursement is from PG&E as part of this program with some of the funding from our clean energy program if, if people are going to eventually need these upgrades for other reasons as well. Um, I, I don't necessarily know if you can, may, maybe Matt, if you have a thought about that, uh, or maybe it's not something that you can answer at this point. Palace Director of Public Works, we've not actually engaged with the community energy on that, on the clean energy program that would engage in this, but you know we certainly could in the future. So I think we ought to consider that as we move forward, as we think about um, how we implement some pilots to begin to help people upgrade their electrical panels through our clean energy program. It may be appropriate to start with some of these locations um, so that we can help people above the 1500, that's a standard reimbursement. The purpose of the memo, one of the purposes of the memo that Councilmember Foley and I submitted is to address the outdated um, reimbursement level that comes with this program. So in the, of the up to $10,000 that a homeowner or, or business may be responsible for, 1,500 of that has a reimbursement that comes back from the program. That number was set some 20 years ago or more and hasn't been upgraded. So uh, the memo encourages the city, and I know it's already in your presentation to do so, to continue to advocate with PG&E and others to increase that number so that the reimbursement will be higher and people will be, would, would be less out of pocket if they needed to upgrade. So um, just want to make sure that that's clear to people who are concerned. We're still years away from these, these, thing, these projects happening and there's still work to do and I hope that we'll be able to improve what's available to people to pay for these upgrades if they need to make them. So I'm going to make a motion uh, to approve the memo submitted by myself and Councilmember Foley. It includes staff recommendation. Second. Great, thank you. Appreciate that and the thought around using uh, the, the memo's great. Also appreciate the point about San Jose Clean Energy Revenues. Councilmember Foley, did you want to comment as well? Uh, yes, Councilmember Cohen covered most of it. Uh, and I appreciate the comments from the individuals in the audience who shared their concerns about the costs. And it sounds like one of those projects may not need upgrading uh, and the others is in the second bucket of the reallocation. So I'm, I'm curious, and, and uh, Matt, I want to thank you for your last minute briefing on this last week. Uh, I, I had a lot of questions about it, so I thank you for taking your time and, and meeting with me. Um, regarding the first list, the, the list where we have the 21 million in credit, that list of seven, it has a total cost of 34 million. Where's the difference in funding coming from? A little bit of inside baseball is this gets to our strategy. So um, it's purposefully designed to be over the 21 million because projects do fall out for a variety of reasons. As we advance the projects with PG&E and other utilities that might be co-located co on those same poles, they might not be viable for construction or other reasons. Then we've got one already at the ready. So by, for lack of a better word, over-legislating additional districts, we better guarantee the full maximization of the 21 million remaining in the work credits owed to the city of San Jose. Similarly, we take a similar approach with that second set of seven, but with, with projects that target the, um, the income equity requirements that PG&E set. Okay, thank you. That's really helpful. In in so, it's possible then, in the first list that one or two of those may fall out, and we still want to expend. We want to use the 21 million we have in credit. So then, it's possible that we would go into the second priority list if we come short of the first list. One through seven, would we then just automatically drop down to the second list and go to the first one, which is Willow Street? Or are these prioritized in 
they are prioritized targeting the two separate funding sources with the different, slightly different requirements. So as I said in the presentation, pg e at the staff level has confirmed that all proposed districts, all 14, meet the Rule 20A requirements. However, the second set has a requirement for any money to be reallocated from another jurisdiction. It needs to meet the income requirements set by the CPC and pg e so it's unlikely to, to move unless that particular project in group one could compete well with group two. I see what you're saying. Okay. Thank you. That's all. That's, thank you for that clarification. I appreciate that. That's the only question I had. Thank you. Thanks, Councilmember. Councilmember Batra. Wait a second here. All right. Okay. So I had a lot of my questions answered during the meeting with Matt. Uh, do you have a couple of clarifications? Um, number one, the last time when this thing was done, uh, other projects which have been completed, who paid for their um, conversions, uh, the panel conversions? In general, property owners are responsible to pay for the costs. That being said, there are instances where sometimes uh, pg e has been willing to cover, but they don't necessarily guarantee that across the board. It's on a case-by-case -case basis as they are engineering and looking at how to complete the project. So in the past, they've looked at each case and they were willing to cover more than what was originally expected? Is that what I'm getting? It has happened on occasion, but it cannot be guaranteed. Yeah. So it is possible that the seven projects which we got, well, we're not going to be able to fund all the seven anyway, even the first category, but whichever ones get funded and they're found to be practical, it is possible that those homeowners would be able to request more than or equal to the cost of their conversion. It is possible. But okay. Cannot right. be guaranteed. Okay. All right. So since undergrounding is really a desirable thing to do, not only for aesthetic reasons, not only for safety reasons, but it is also for the robustness of the delivery of power. So the power outages should be far less, which is what we need as everything is getting electrified. So we would need for everybody to be able to have practically zero outage, okay? Is there some program which is going to get replace this one from a safety standpoint or environmental considerations or robustness of power supply? Is there any coming from the federal government, state government or something where we might be able to find some money to carry on beyond these 14 projects? Council member, I'm not aware of any of those programs that we can follow up. I know uh, I just want to clarify what's largely in the news cycle uh, with PG&E as the largest investor-owned utility in the country and in California. Um, they are pursuing the undergrounding of transmission lines, largely in rural areas due to the wildfire risks. Uh, even this morning, New York Times had a headline article about potential with all of the nation's climate and green energy goals, the, the grid is woefully underbuilt and doesn't have the capacity to accommodate the massive influx of solar, wind, and other renewable energy. So I think we can follow up and coordinate with our colleagues in other departments, uh, and, and I'll stick in my public works uh, swim lane, but I think you're identifying uh, as other council members, there's a lot of opportunities, and this is only the tip of the spear for uh, the City Council and this issue to continue for resiliency. Okay, all right, uh, the last question. You have on the polls other companies like Comcast and all, their stuff is there. When this undergrounding happens, do they pay anything at all in terms of doing the work or is it all pg and &E credits? Yes, under a separate rule, I believe uh, it's rule 35 and my colleagues can correct me. Uh, yes, the telecom companies are also responsible for covering their costs. 
That also contributes to some of the slowdown and coordination between utilities and the city to ensure that all assets located on those wood poles can safely be redesigned and moved underground. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Councilor, Councilor Duan. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, staff, for working extremely hard to, to make sure that this distribution and continue to happen as we modernize our city for the future generation, especially towards safety um, and making sure that not only safety but also aesthetically that we're going to look towards the future as we become an AI hub. I just want to thank you to my colleague uh, Pam Foley and David Cohen for thinking about our residents who have to encumber the, the heavy cost. And I hope that somewhere we'll double the amount of, of funding um, to help our residents and our businesses to upgrade to the new line. And I just want to recognize and thank you very much for doing that. And I will be supporting this measure. Thank you. Thanks, Council Member. Um, also be supporting the measure. I, I do think there are two challenges uh, related with moving forward. One is just affordability, and I, I do worry about working families and the impact this can have on individual residents. So I would like to join in the advocacy to PG&E and other entities to try to increase the reimbursement rate or find other creative ways of defraying that cost. I think Council Member Cohen's point about our clean energy net revenues is a really good one. The other is the speed at which we do this. We can approve these and then it can still take a very long time uh, for the undergrounding to happen. And I'm, I'm curious, are there, if we ever explored being compensated to do the work on our end, is that something we've ever looked at? Particularly in areas that we think are particularly strategic, such as Umberger? Thank you for the question, Mayor. Uh, Catherine Brown, Assistant Director. We have explored this in the past with PG&E. Uh, they've been reluctant, but lately they've been really receptive partners, and so that's definitely something that we're willing to explore again and treat this much like a Rule uh, Rule 20B project where the city staff can then, uh, you know, we can create capacity within our staff and take on the responsibility of coordinating the, the design work and implementing the construction contract uh, to hopefully expedite faster than PG&E could. Right. Great. I think it's worth at least looking at, especially for sites like Umberger, where we, where we think it's particularly strategic and we, we want to accelerate. And I, I don't know that we can do it faster and cheaper, but I think it's worth at least looking at. Um, okay. That was all I had. I don't see any other hands. Looks like we're ready to vote. Motion passes unanimously with Kimmy absent. Okay, thank you all. We are on to item 5.1, City of San Jose Community Forest Investment Project. There's no presentation. Do we have any public comment? I have no cards. Okay, back to the council. Move Everybody approval. Read the item. Okay, motion from Councilmember Foley, second from Councilmember Dewan. Councilmember Ortiz. Sorry, I do got some questions. Um, but is there anybody? Okay, great. Um, so we just want to share my appreciation to the dedicated staff from the multiple departments, um, including DOT, PRNS, the Budget Office, and PBCE, for their efforts um, just to make sure we're securing funds for the Community Forest Investments Project. Um, I just have a quick question. Will there be collaboration plans established between staff from the, the Department of Transportation and PRNS, as well as our council offices for engaging with the community regarding this project? Uh, thank you, John Ritzel, Director of Transportation. Yeah, to the degree that it would involve community, much of the work that we're going to be doing is going to be a pruning and uh, tree maintenance program that we're going to conduct in certain areas of the city. So we would be informing property owners and there wouldn't be a lot of community engagement mm -hmm. beyond that. So that part, the planting part, as we uh, do always when we're doing community planting with our partners, mm -hmm. uh, our city force or others, we do 
we'll certainly be doing some community outreach for those parts how, of the program. How will the, the tree canopy um, planting, how will that be based on priority? Will those with, with districts with the lowest canopy we, get priority? Well, yeah, to the degree that this is going to be used for planting, we'll be coordinating with uh, council offices and then also trying to find locations that can accept the trees. So it's a it's another difficult thing, trying to find those places that the property mm -hmm. owner or uh, other fronting properties can actually accept those and maintain them. Outside of um, working with the Conservation Corps, is there any other strategies or approaches being utilized to engage youth um, with, this, with this project? Uh, our City Forest is a partner on this. Uh, mm -hmm. Conservation Corps, as you just mentioned, um, much of this work is going to be done by small contractors as well as our own city city uh, teams but beyond that that's about the extent of it okay thank you thanks Councilor. I appreciate those questions and just on the locations it's worth noting the uh, the justice 40 census tracts that I understand yep. are part of the program there. there are 78 census tracts predominantly in districts 3 7 and 5 as I understood and a bit into district 8 that will be just for folks who are paying attention. That'll be the the emphasis here. I don't That's know if there's anything else you want. in those areas, right? Exclusively, yeah. yeah. Okay, great. All right, uh, Councilor. Yeah, uh, sorry, Mayor, I have my hand. Out. I, I pressed the button too soon. I'm too excited. John, I just wanted to give you uh, kudos. Um, um, I appreciate the fact that we're going after this and and tree canopy coverage, especially in East San Jose. To my colleague's point, is is super important. Um, I know there's certain parts of District Eight that um, are completely uh you know bald <laughs> to say that to say the least so i look forward to uh to seeing the 20 to 100 new street trees being planned especially in east san jose and hopefully getting the invite to that so we can uh, do some good work in, in collaboration with our contractors thank yep. you we hope this is just a start so Likewise. we're going to be going after other grants awesome thanks council member yeah let's keep going 5.6 million is a, is a great down payment but we have a long way to go thanks, thanks john Okay, let's vote. Motion passes unanimously with Kamei absent. Okay, great. So we have one item left that was agendized for a time certain hearing at 5.30 p.m. So we will recess until 5.30. And, and I'll see you all then. Thank you.